This video offers an alternate theory for the explosions at Grosvenor on the 6th of May in 2020. The Board of Inquiry which followed the explosions ultimately concluded that there were two separate sources of ignition for the two separate explosions approximately 15 seconds apart. I don't agree with that finding and have requested a review of the Board of Inquiry. The experts agree that there were two pressure waves approximately 15 seconds apart. The board receives advice from its experts, and one expert, with the information available to him, initially advised the board that there would have been no viable flame sources within the area of origin of the first explosion to cause the first pressure wave. However, if you overlay the pressure waves of the two explosions, they have an almost identical pressure profile. Everyone agrees that the second pressure wave was a methane explosion, which ignited at or near the long wall face, resulting in serious burns to the mine workers that were located near the tailgate end of the face. The question remains, what was the source of ignition for the second explosion? The experts and the board discounted the relationship between the two pressure waves considering the flame speed and the time between the two events. After initially discounting the possibility of the first pressure wave being an explosion, the expert advises that there must be some other cause, such as a gulf failure or strata fall in the gulf. However, with an identical pressure wave, it's hard to agree with this conclusion. There was no evidence to say that the first pressure wave was a methane explosion, but no evidence to eliminate that it wasn't. Initially, the experts had no evidence to determine what could have been the source of ignition for the second pressure wave. The initial expert report is inconclusive with respect to the cause of the first pressure wave and the possible source of ignition for the second pressure wave, which was ultimately determined to be a methane explosion due to the serious burns to the mine workers. However, in a subsequent report, one worker described the time between the overpressures and the flame as being minutes, when in fact it was actually 15 seconds. But the description of the first pressure wave is only described in that report as being a go fall rather than possibly an explosion. The inquiry sought further advice in relation to the flame front velocity in the go. The expert assumed a flame propagation speed of three and a half meters per second. Because no witnesses observed any flame from the first overpressure, possible explanations considered that it was not an explosion, but a roof fall. But if it was an explosion in the gulf, the flammable gas would have been consumed and not been a source of ignition for the second explosion. The expert reports do consider the possibility of two combined explosions, one in the gulf and the second closer to the face. However, because no flame was observed, the expert is more suggestive of a substantial rockfall and then speculates potential cable damage as the source of ignition for the second explosion. Despite additional information being provided, the original conclusions were not altered. Having been further advised that there was likely a spontaneous combustion in the Gopher 104, the expert then considers it equally probable that there was either an explosion or a roof fall that two explosions may have occurred. The first in the gulf, the second closer to the face. The expert then speculates that if there was coal combustion in the gulf behind 111 shock, this could have been the source of ignition for the second explosion close to the face. However, there is no evidence of this. The problem with the theory of the expert and ultimately the findings of the board is that if the first pressure wave was a roof fall, which the pressure wave indicates that it was most likely not, and the strata at the mine is not likely to result in pressure waves, it does not require a source of ignition. But then because the second pressure wave resulted in flames, there needs to be a source of ignition. However, none was able to be found. There is no evidence that the second source ignition was from the PUR or spontaneous combustion or any other potential source of ignition. The likelihood of two methane explosions happening with two separate independent source of ignition within 15 seconds of each other, I would say, 
is most unlikely. Since the Pike River explosion in New Zealand in 2010, I've been conducting methane explosion demonstrations. I demonstrated methane explosions to the Board of Inquiry. And what makes an explosion in a GOF more complex is that the GOF is not just one simple gas mixture with limited fuel. The GOF area is a large void filled mostly with fuel-rich methane concentrations with fringes of oxygen and most likely explosive mixtures of gas. In my view, what most likely happened is that the first pressure wave was an explosion in the GOF ignited by an undetected or unrecognised small intense spontaneous combustion and then two things happened. Firstly, there was an explosion which created the pressure wave which was felt by the workers on the face and recorded on the mine's ventilation monitoring but it also ignited a fuel-rich concentration of methane which then continued to burn. It would have burned along an oxygen fringe which then ignited the second explosive mixture of methane which was closer to the face resulting in the second pressure wave and the flame from the explosion erupted onto the long wall face. Combined methane explosions and fires are not unusual. At Upper Big Branch in the USA in 2010, a friction ignition on the long wall face in the tailgate resulted in a fuel-rich methane fire. That fire burned for approximately three minutes before it encountered an explosive mixture of methane, which then exploded. Unfortunately, the methane explosion then initiated a coal dust explosion and it propagated around the mine 29 miners died. In 2011, at Blakefield South in New South Wales, a large methane explosion unexpectedly occurred in the Gulf of Longwall 1, believed to have been most likely ignited by lightning. No flame was observed by any person, but the pressure wave knocked a supervisor standing on the Longwall face off his feet and it was felt by other workers in the mine up to three kilometres away. When the deputy went to the target to investigate, he found a large methane fire burning behind the target chocks. There was an explosion and then there was a fire. The fire burned for up to a month until the mine was sealed and inertized in order to be extinguished. When the mine was re-ventilated, the fire restarted and then three further explosions occurred. The point and the lesson is that the fuel in the GOF is not just one simple explosive mixture of gas. It's surrounded by complex gas concentrations, mostly fuel-rich, sometimes oxygen-rich, sometimes explosive. And even when it is in the explosive range, the characteristics of a methane explosion vary based on the concentration, the volume, the degree of confinement, the source ignition, and the direction of propagation. In my view, what most likely happened at Grosvenor was that the first pressure wave was a spontaneous combustion-initiated methane explosion which no one observed, but it initiated a methane fire that burned for a further 15 seconds towards the face when then it encountered another explosive mixture of gas, which caused the second explosion, resulting in a pressure wave and serious burns to the miners near the target end of the face. The two explosions were almost identical in volume and duration, as demonstrated by the pressure waves recorded by the ventilation monitoring. Methane explosions can be either low-velocity or high-velocity explosions. The velocity of the explosion is dependent upon the degree of confinement of the exploding mixture of gas. Where an explosion can be vented, the velocity of propagation of the explosion is much lower and the flame duration is much longer. In some cases, the pressure from the explosion is in the opposite direction to the direction of propagation of the explosion. This would result in much more serious burns or flame damage. Where the pressure is unable to be vented, the velocity of propagation is much higher and the pressure wave precedes the flame front and is in the direction of the explosion. In these circumstances, the pressure wave is more likely to create turbulence and potentially raise dust into the atmosphere and potentially create a coal dust explosion such as at Kyanga in 1975, Mara 4 in 1986 and Upper Big Branch in America in 2010. The board sought further information in relation to the potential of having cascading explosions. The board was advised that it was not likely due to the explosion flame velocity, 
which is correct in the theory that the flame from the first explosion was not the source ignition for the second explosion. But in a GOF, and most likely a Grosvenor, I believe that there was a fuel-rich methane fire that continued to burn in the 15 seconds between the two explosions. It's my view that the first explosion initiated a methane explosion, creating the pressure wave, but also igniting a rich mixture of gas which burned in the period between the two explosions. This methane fire most likely became the source of ignition for the second explosion and resulting in the burns to the workers. There was no second source of ignition from the PUR or from the spontaneous combustion of coal from the PUR. At Upper Big Branch, the methane fire burned for three minutes before it encountered an explosive mixture of methane and then it exploded. At Blakefield South, the explosion initiated a go fire that burned for a month before it could be extinguished. The difference in a GOF, rather than other places where fires or explosions occur, is that most fires or explosions occur in an oxygen or an air-rich environment, where air is the predominant gas and the fuel is the contaminant. When the fire explosion occurs, the fuel is consumed and then is extinguished. In a GOF, methane can be the predominant gas and oxygen is the contaminant. And when an explosion occurs, it isn't the fuel that's consumed, it's the oxygen, and there can be an endless supply of fuel. In the circumstances at Grosvenor, it's more likely that a methane fire continued in the GOF after the first explosion and become the source of ignition for the second explosion. Despite extensive monitoring, investigation, inspection and testing, no second source of ignition was identified. The board concluded that it was most likely a PUR-induced spontaneous combustion of coal at or around 111 shock. However, there was no evidence of this, the same as there was no evidence of any other second source of ignition. Approximately a month later, on the 8th of June, another explosion occurred from spontaneous combustion near number 96 shock, but that wasn't present on the 6th of May. In my view, the board's findings are not based on the evidence before it. The board also failed to consider the likelihood of a fire between the methane explosions, which is consistent with other GOF explosions in mines in recent times. One, two, three! Thank <laughs> you.